So today, it is truly a pleasure to introduce Dr. Barbara Van Oppen, who is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and vice chair for faculty development. Dr. Van Oppen went to elementary school at the Charles Lindbergh Elementary School in Kenmore, New York, near Buffalo, also near to the Lackawanna Steel Factory leading to a lifelong dedication to the Buffalo Bills. I told her that I would not go into a lengthy diatribe around her educational experiences, and so that's all I'll say about that. Rather, I wanted to focus on her content today. She'll be speaking with us about the five dysfunctions of a team, a model that she has advocated in our own department and that has been incredibly helpful. She'll be speaking with the group about team building and the impact that has on the health of an organization. This approach has been transformative for the Department of Psychiatry in, in more ways than I can uh, describe. And Barbara's impact in helping us become a healthier, more effective organization has been really immeasurable. This concept of learning how to build teams and how to build a healthy organization, I think is critical for career development and effectiveness in all of our trainees and in every career. And I'll just end with an anecdote that I've been so impressed with this, that as a mentor on a, a, a training grant application, I recently put in that specific training in management and leadership would include reading this book and going through the steps that it takes to build an effective team. So today we're fortunate to have Dr. Van Oppen to lead us through that. And I know that this will be as enjoyable as it is informative. So Barbara, thank you for doing this and welcome to the Career Development Seminar Series today. Thank you, Dr. Siegel, for that wonderful introduction and remembering where I went to elementary school. I also want to thank you, Dr. Siegel, and the CTSI for inviting me to talk with all of you today as part of your career development series on a topic I am very passionate about, leadership and team building. I hope you all had a chance to read The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, the fabled version which Karen sent to you. If not, hopefully what you hear will be intriguing and lead you to read this book. I have used this model with a couple of our leadership groups in psychiatry, as Dr. Siegel mentioned, and within a very short time, we have noticed a change in behavior. The teams seem more collaborative and um, more cohesive. The relationships seem to promote more of a collegial team culture. Most of the leaders have also commented on the positive benefit of the investment in time and energy. And I'll be getting into more detail in terms of the benefits of overcoming the five dysfunctions through my talk. For those of you who have not read the book, it is an engaging read about a tech startup company in Silicon Valley and how a newly hired CEO, who the team is very skeptical of, uses the Lencioni model to transform her challenging dysfunctional team. I would like to acknowledge that in the larger context of our national divisiveness, that now surrounds us daily, Lencioni's five dysfunction model takes on even greater import, emphasizing the need for organizational health, leadership and team building, yes, even in the arena of research. We could all benefit from experiencing our number one team as in one boat, all rowing in the same direction. This may sound, sound idealistic, however, using this model, you can get there with commitment over time. As you heard in the book, the team still had a lot of work to do at the end, even after making significant progress over the course of a year and two two full day offsite retreats. Change occurs slowly, but it is worth the investment because in the end, it will save your team more time. The return on investment is priceless. Lencioni was very in, uh, intentional in titling this book. He believed that no one would be interested or even read it if he entitled it The Five Functions of a Team. He happened to be finishing this book when 9-11 occurred, 
and it hit home the point that teams such as first responders, firefighters, emergency room providers demonstrate that by focusing on clear, urgent, common goals, dysfunctions become reduced. We've also seen this during the pandemic in various forms across KSOM and our health system. So let's not wait for one more crisis to develop healthy teams. I am gonna be manipulating my own slides and then going back and forth a little bit um, because I have a number of YouTube clips because no one can say this better than Len Chioni. So I've tried to perfect the switching so it won't be too much of a delay in time, but please bear with me for your with your patience. So my learning objectives for us today are to identify and describe the five dysfunctions of a leadership team based on the Lencioni model. Keep in mind, there are many leadership models. This is one, I happen to be partial and I've seen um, the benefits of it. So we're gonna be focusing on this model only today. To identify the steps to develop trust on teams, to differentiate and define the two types of leaders and to describe what an ideal team player is and how to assess individuals. So what is organizational health? To maximize results, Lencioni says that teams and organizations must not just be smart, they also must be healthy. Smart organizations are good at decision sciences like strategy, marketing, finance, and technology. And yes, those skills are all critical. However, without health, the smart only gets an organization so far. Healthy organizations create the kind of cultures that take advantage of being smart. They minimize politics. And I'd like to pause for a moment to define what Lencioni means about politics in this context. So in this context, um, politics are when team members or leaders choose behaviors and words based on how they want to impact, influence other people and create an effect. That's about um, forming a persona to give a certain um, per uh, perception that is in the individual's best interest, not the team. So it can be manipulative, most often is. However, more recently, Lencioni has been talking about the use of politics to avoid discomfort because if people really say what they want to say and what they're thinking of, it can be off-putting to those in their group and then they have to deal with those difficult conversations. Healthy organizations also minimize confusion by having clear goals that are aligned. They raise morale because the people who are working there want to work there and are excited about um, working together as a team, spending time together as a team, and also working towards the common goal, thereby also increasing productivity and returning, reducing the turnover of the best employees. But again, one has to invest energy and make time to cultivate this culture. It doesn't just happen. You can't take shortcuts and the leader has to be very committed. Who is Patrick Lencioni besides being the author of the five dysfunctions of a team? He is the founder and president of the Table Group, which is a strategic consulting group that promotes organizational health. Pat was the pioneer of the organizational health movement. He has authored over 11 books that are sold, um, have sold over 6 million copies in 30 languages. He's a very passionate, engaging speaker, which you will see. And he has numerous podcasts and YouTube videos, webinars that I've also, if, if you like what you hear today, I would encourage you to um, check out more of his material. So how can this model help me? The model is more broadly applicable. Um, mostly there are Fortune 500 corporations who consult with Lencioni and his table group, small companies, but also there have been some hospitals rarely academic centers um, and teams such as ours. And I'm really proud to um, say what we've done in psychiatry and thank Dr. Siegel for all his support because I think we're one of the probably very few departments in an academic medical center that has um, been committed to try to employ this model. It's also used by religious organizations. Pat um, is very committed to his church. He will make several references to that. 
And it also can be used by families and I believe extrapolate to research teams. The model serves to provide a framework for more successful leadership for the right reasons and better outcomes. So um, I welcome you to think about your teams, um, lab teams, section groups, perhaps multidisciplinary PI teams. And uh, for those of you who are in junior positions, considering future leadership roles in research and academia. As I mentioned, this is useful in families. Pat wrote a book called The Three Big Questions for a Frantic Family. He often makes references about how these principles can be used in relationships in our families. And so it definitely can also help your personal life. The model is best utilized when a team has four to seven people to really establish that foundation of trust. Um, one of our recent leadership teams had 18, which I felt was a bit large. We would have needed a lot more time to really get to that vulnerability trust that Lencioni talks about. Um, so the size does matter, but I do think that a lot of the applications um, can be put to work and there still can be benefit even in larger groups. So why are you a leader or why would you want to be a leader? Well, um, Lencioni wrote this last book called The Motive. It was just published in March 2020. And when he talks about the book, it, it's his 11th book, but he says it should have been his first because all the rest of his material talks about how to be a leader. And now he's stepping back to ask the critical question of why are you a leader? And basically he distills it down to two reasons. There's a wrong reason and then the only reason. The wrong reason, as many of you are probably thinking, would be for purely um, egotistical kind of uh, fulfillment. This would be leaders who reach the top of their career and now think they don't need to do any of the work. They abdicate responsibility. And similarly to that would be like if uh, somebody wants to be a parent and they say, I want to be a parent, but I don't want to get up in the middle of the night. Uh, I'm not going to change diapers. I'm not going to spend my weekends going to sporting events or school events. Um, there are leaders who, who believe that they don't need to roll up their sleeves and do the work anymore because they're at the top. The wrong reason for leading is also for fame and success. I'm sure none of us know leaders who lead for the wrong reason. The only reason is to serve. It is to embrace responsibility and see responsibility as a privilege. Uh, it's about serving your people. It's about wanting the good for the whole and organizing your teams so that they are, as I said earlier, all rowing in the same direction to achieve common goals. And it's a sacrifice. The reality for people in leadership roles, all of us, it's not so black and white. We all slide, we all have some ego. There's gotta be some ego involved in wanting to, leader, to be a leader. Although again, it's gotta be for the good of the team. It's important to be honest with yourself and provide self-assessment to consider if leadership is for you. I will mention Gary Kelly, I don't know um, since I can't really see anybody. We don't have interaction. How many of you are familiar with Gary Kelly? He is a stellar example of a CEO who leads for the only reason. He's the CEO of Southwest Airlines and most people wouldn't be able to even identify him in a room. He is known as one of the most successful CEOs of a company in the country and he's um, extremely understated. Most people, like I said, aren't even aware of who he is. And Alan Mullally is another uh, example of a leader for the right and only reasons. He took over Ford Motor Company, he turned it around, and he also talks about leadership as a privilege. So to introduce you to Lencioni, I'm going to just show part of this where he's talking at a conference he calls an unconference um, about leadership. <laughs>
welcome all of our viewers on our simulcast today, our live stream, where we are at the Unconference in Dallas, Texas. We call it an Unconference because it's really more like a family reunion, where we're just... We're just here, we have people on couches and all over this, this uh, room, and we're just learning and enjoying and, and sharing our experiences around organizational health. And today in this live stream, we are going to talk about my new book, my latest book, which came out a week ago today, which is called The Motive. And, and I think, I just think it might be the most important book I've written. I know everybody wants to say that, you know, like, oh, my most recent child, he's the best or she's the best. But, but I think this actually might be the most important book I've written because, and, and, and if, if somebody had a stack of my books on a table and said, which one should I start with? I'd probably say do the motive first because it's not about how to manage or lead. Most of my books are about how to lead or how to manage or how to build a team, but it's about why. It's about why you would want to do it in the first place. And what I've learned is if your why is off, the hows don't really make any sense. So let me start by saying something kind of controversial or countercultural. And it goes like this. I think fewer people in society should become leaders. What I mean by that is this. When I go to a graduation, like a college graduation, and, uh, and somebody gets up there to speak and says, go out there and be leaders. Everybody should go out and be a leader. I want to stand up and say, no. Don't be a leader unless you know why you would become a leader and you have the right motive. And most 22-year-olds don't. I mean, I certainly didn't get this when I was that age. Now, when I was a kid, everybody said, be a leader. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. So I became a captain on our Little League teams and ran for student body president of my school. But did I really understand the motive for that? No. And if we don't have the right motive, bad things happen. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what we're going to talk Okay, so just wanted to give you a little taste of him and uh, we will come back to more. Um, I will say that this book is, a, is an easy read. It's also in a fable version. So it's very similar to um, The Five Dysfunction and it takes place, um, it's really interactions between two very different CEOs over the course of a day. Very good read. Important concept that Lencioni also talks about is your team one, because you might be sitting here, if you're on multiple teams wondering, well, who is my team? Your team one is the highest team that you're on. There are uh, typically multiple teams in any organization, but you'd have to think about sort of the highest level team that you're on and your loyalty and focus is first for your team one. Um, that's where top decisions are made and that's where all these principles apply. You can use them on other teams as well, but it's important that you feel like that's your primary commitment. A lot of us end up working in silos. I know our department is scattered across different services um, on the health science campus and now UPC. And so people tend to identify their team one as probably the people that you spend the most time with on that more um, kind of service related team, but that is not your team one. And it's not like uh, the US Congress where you represent your constituents at this team. The goals for team one become the primary goals for the whole organization. Team one is like parents in a family needing alignment and cohesiveness. All right, so uh, let's review the model. And um, during the course of quarantine since March, Lencioni also has a number of podcasts and he created one called Five Dysfunctions of a Quarren Team, which talks about how to address the five dysfunctions using a virtual um, platform. And he had some things to say that um, perhaps makes the time that we're going through even more amenable to addressing some of these five dysfunctions since people do tend to feel more vulnerable being in their own homes as I am now um, and sharing more personal uh, information and leading to what's called this vulnerability trust, which is the foundation of the triangle. Um, and Catherine, if you remember from the book, she spent her first month as CEO observing the meetings at Decision Tech, because meetings are a really good way to see what's going on in a team and how these dysfunctions manifest. 
just to run through the triangle and then we're going to take a little deeper dive into each of these constructs. So uh, Lencioni differentiates between predictive trust, which is the kind of trust we have when we know someone's going to do a good job, when we can count on certain behaviors. That's important, but what's more important in this model is what he calls vulnerability trust. And that's about being able to be who you are, to show your weaknesses, to not have your weaknesses used against you, um, and really be able to know that everybody's got each other's back, to talk openly, which is very different than having politics. And in order to then move up the triangle to get to the results, which is the ultimate goal of the team, uh, trust will lead to constructive conflict. And by this, I don't mean you go into your meetings with your boxing gloves on. It's about having constructive disagreements that are in the best interest of the team. So ideas are tossed around, everybody can be heard, which then leads to commitment and a sense of buy-in. So people, um, it's believed, will, will weigh in and then buy in, even if it's not getting their way which then will lead to the team holding one another accountable because once there's a commitment, there are clear action items and expectations of behaviors of one another that will then take us to results. And these aren't individual results, they're collective team results. And you're gonna hear me being a little repetitive about this, but I think some of these basic constructs are, are really important. Um, I'm gonna give you an example that I came across while I was preparing for this presentation, because I, I don't work in a lab. Um, I have colleagues that work in a lab. I have patients that work in a lab. I provide um, cognitive behavioral therapy at Keck. So I work with a lot of graduate students. Um, I have done clinical research, but I'm trying to think about how would we extrapolate this that might be meaningful um, for the researchers in the audience. And, and I'm thinking about labs. So I was working with a PhD student who came to me for some therapy. And one of his major triggers were situations in interpersonal um, uh, interactions that occurred in his lab. And he talked about how there was a lot of competition for coveted RA um, positions and that most people didn't want to end up being a TA and that his lab boss would say things to him all the time. He was a very, very hard worker, put in like 10 hour, 12 hour, sometimes be there like overnight working, very, very committed. Um, would say to him things like, don't worry, I have your back. Um, you're gonna be an RA this year. And I'm sure all of you know how stressful it is waiting for grant money and um, budgets to come through. And this had nothing to do with budgets, but that was just another layer. And the week before classes start, and this was a repetitive, um, kind of consistent uh, pattern is that this young man would be told, oh, well, I'm sorry, I had to give so-and-so the RA position for such and such reasons, I, I want you to be a TA. So that's one example um, of how trust can be eroded. It created a lot of resentment and competition among the coworkers, everyone trying to be like the stellar research assistant to prove themselves, almost like sibling rivalry. Um, another example is that um, often um, supplies that were needed as well as equipment, um, supplies that were needed when, would be used up and equipment that was needed for um, this young man to run his experiments would be broken and it wouldn't be replaced and the lab boss would do nothing about it. Um, coworkers sort of looked the other way, did not take responsibility. And in the end, in order for him to complete his work, he would end up uh, ordering the supplies, replacing the equipment, and then it got to the point where to ensure that he'd be able to do his work, he would start to hide supplies and um, hoard and hoard them. And that also then created undercurrents of um, competition and resentment. And then he came in to one session really upset because he had been promised authorship on the paper, another sensitive topic, as we know. And he had put in a lot of work on the project. And then when it came time to drafting and really um, writing the paper, he was excluded and another coworker was invited to participate who had um, contributed very, very little. So I think these are some good examples. I don't think this is unique to this one lab. Um, so I just wanna get you thinking about how the dysfunctions may look um, in your arena at work.
and we're going to hear a really quick overview of Pat running through the dysfunctions. When it comes to creating a healthy organization, the first and most important discipline is the building of a cohesive leadership team at the top. And that entails the overcoming of the five dysfunctions of a team, which I'm going to review very quickly here. The first dysfunction of a team is the absence of trust. Trust is critical on a team. It's the foundation of teamwork. And what it requires is that people get vulnerable with one another, that they're very open about who they are, what they're good at, what they're not good at, if they've made a mistake. Without trust, we cannot build a team. Specifically, because without trust, we can't overcome the second dysfunction, which is the fear of conflict. You see, conflict is not only okay on a team or even good, it's necessary and required. We have to engage in conflict. And when we have trust, conflict becomes nothing but the passionate pursuit of truth or the best possible answer. Why is conflict so important? Because without it, we're going to encounter the third dysfunction of a team, which is the lack of commitment. Teams that don't engage in open, honest conflict don't really commit to the decisions they make. They're passive about it. Commitment is when everybody truly buys in because they've weighed in on a decision and they realize that's what they're all going to stick with. Now, why is commitment so important? Because without it, we're going to encounter the fourth and most common dysfunction of a team, which is the inability of people to hold each other accountable. Accountability is so important on a team. When people have committed, they're going to have more courage to actually confront one another about shortcomings in their behavior and their performance. And why is that accountability so important? Because if people aren't holding each other accountable, they're going to encounter the next and final dysfunction, which is the inattention to results. Now, you might say, well, what are people paying attention to if not results? Well, maybe it's not the collective results of the team they're interested in, but just their own individual results, their budget, their department, their staff. If we're going to focus on the collective results of the team, we have to trust one another. We have to engage in healthy conflict. We have to commit to decisions, hold one another accountable for those, and achieve true collective results. Those are the five dysfunctions of a team. When it comes to creating a healthy organization, Sorry, the first and most important discipline is. Okay, so to do a little deeper dive into each of these five dysfunctions, and we will talk about the anecdotes also, antidotes. Um, first is the absence of trust. And as we've been saying, it's about vulnerability versus predictive trust. So it's about team members being able to conceal their weaknesses and mistakes, um, hesitating to ask for help. This has changed a lot. And, and since we've done this with the our team building, we've had a number of faculty who have come forth to say they've always felt like they've just needed to solve these problems on their own. And now people are reaching out to one another um, much more liberally, which is great to see. Uh, without trust, people jump to conclusions about intentions and tend to misread and make attributions about why somebody is behaving the way they are, which usually involves malintent. Um, people hold grudges. They waste time and energy managing behavior for effects, as I said, politics. Maybe you could think about on your teams, do you say what you really think and want to say, or do you say what you think other people want to hear? I, mean, I think it, that's ubiquitous in all organizations and is just part of a culture that we become complacent to. Um, I think it's a big part of what goes on in academic medicine, um, as well as other organizations. And I think it would take a lot of time to change, to change that culture. Um, also, people don't, don't trust, don't offer for help outside of their lane. And now we're going to listen to Pat say a little bit more. About so let's trust. talk about the five dysfunctions of a team. The first dysfunction of a team is the absence of trust. So I just told you that this stuff is simple. You're hearing this. If you're hearing it for the first time, you're thinking, no, duh. Did this guy just say, if you want to build a team, you have to trust each other. Yeah, it's so obvious, isn't it? And I realize that, and it is. But there's something about trust. Most people think about trust in a different way than I'm talking about it. See, most people think of trust as predictive trust, which means you and I have known each other long enough now to where if I say something, you'll know how to, you'll be able to predict my behavior. Or if we're in a meeting or at a team and you do something, I know what I can expect from you because we can predict one another's behavior. That's predictive trust. And any group of people that's known each other for a long period of time can have predictive trust, but that's not the kind of trust that makes a team great. 
The kind of trust that makes a team great is what I call vulnerability-based trust. Vulnerability-based trust. That's the kind of trust that comes about when human beings on a team can and will genuinely say things to one another like, I don't know the answer, I need help, I think I really messed this up, you are much smarter than I am, can you teach me how to be like you, or I'm sorry, what I said yesterday was totally out of line, and I, I apologize. When human beings can be that emotionally buck naked, if you will, with each other, not pretending to be something they're not, when they can be that vulnerable, it changes the dynamics on a team completely. Okay. All righty, now we're going on to fear of conflict. So it can be a little misleading because, you know, conflict in this case isn't about um, a butting of heads that people often get into conflict where it's around personal issues or reactions to each other personally or taking things personally. It's more about um, ideological conflict. So um, in, in uh, teams where there's a fear of conflict, the meetings are boring. As you saw in this fable, it was very agenda heavy. People either were working on their laptops and answering emails like Martin did, um, of, uh, really wanting to avoid the meeting, dreading going, there's little member par participation, avoidance of controversial topics that are really critical to the success of the team. Um, and members are not allowed to express their opinion or there's an atmosphere that that's not wanted. It's more about nodding and agreeing even though people aren't really feeling that way. And then the thing that happens with politics, again, um, posturing, wasting time and energy with the posturing and manipulating um, is that it leads to back channel attacks. So, you know, this would be similar to a student who maybe um, you know, kisses up to a teacher or professor and it's sort of disgusting to watch. And then afterwards in the lunchroom, you know, tears that person apart. Um, and certainly in the book, we saw Mickey doing this a lot by making destructive uh, and personally derogatory remarks to other people and rolling her eyes. Then we have the lack of commitment. Um, and the lack of commitment is when there's ambiguity about directions and priorities and the team engages in excessive analysis to arrive at a right decision because there's a fear of uncertainty. And this isn't to say that some analysis isn't important, but teams can waste an inordinate amount of time collecting data and feeling that they have to make exactly the right decision instead of making a timely decision and not missing an opportunity. Um, teams that demonstrate a lack of commitment, are afraid of those mistakes, and then admitting those mistakes, and then making a change in direction. There's an artificial harmony. It breeds a lack of confidence and a fear of failure. This is best seen when um, the leader makes a decision or waits for consensus, which sometimes doesn't happen, but people just nod their heads because they want to get the meeting over with. And then they go off to their constituents to tell um, either their other faculty or their coworkers or their um, subordinates about a change that's going to take place or a new process or a new procedure, but they say it half-heartedly. So often going back, if there's not commitment and buy-in, people go back to their teams on which they're leaders and say things like, oh yeah, well, you know, the chair wants us to um, you know, change the way that we um, order our supplies or take call or we need to revisit our budget. And it's very half-hearted so that the leader doesn't even endorse whatever that order is. So it, right there, it just all falls apart because um, the rest of the group isn't going to follow suit either. And then that's going to interfere with productivity and results. So we have to teach our teams trust so that they will engage in good conflict. Now, some CEOs will say, I don't care if people get their feelings hurt, Pat. I just don't want to waste a bunch of time arguing. Why don't I just make the decision for them and we'll move on? I'll be their hero and save them three hours so they can go read email or something. But when we do that, when we, when we 
skip over important conflict, we end up putting ourselves in a position to encounter the next dysfunction of a team, which is the lack of commitment. The lack of commitment. You see, when people don't weigh in on a subject, when there's no disagreement or conflict, when people don't weigh in, they don't buy into the decision. I fundamentally believe that. If people don't weigh in, they don't buy in. Now, just in case you think I'm arguing for consensus, please know, God bless you, that consensus to me is a four-letter word. I don't like consensus. If we wait for consensus in our organizations, we will usually make decisions that are too late and mutually disagreeable to everyone. We need to be able to make this, we need to do what Intel, the, the chip manufacturer, you know, the computer chip manufacturers talks about. They have this saying, they say, disagree and commit. What a beautiful thing. We can disagree, but then we can commit to an answer and walk out of the room together. But the only way to do that is if we as leaders provoke good constructive conflict. We have to demand that the people that work for us weigh in. And we have a difficult decision to make. Are we going to expand or are we going to contract? Are we, what are we going to do? Are we going to build a satellite church? Or are we going to add on here, whatever it might be? And we have to sit down with our team and say, what do you think? And we have to demand that people stand up and weigh in. And then at the end of that discussion, when there's not a natural consensus, and there rarely is, if there is, hallelujah, thank God we move on. But there's not a natural consensus, consensus, that's when we as leaders have to do what we're paid the medium-sized bucks to do, and that's break the tie. We have to say, I think I've heard from everybody here, and I understand why you want to expand, and I want, understand why you want a satellite, and I understand why you want to build here, I understand why you don't want to do either, I get it, I get it. My job as your leader now is to break the tie, and here's what we're going to do, we're going to build the satellite. And I realize that you might be right after all, but this is a decision we're gonna make and I need your commitment. Do you know that 99 out of 100 times, those people will support that decision even if they disagreed? We're not talking about moral ethical decisions here. We're talking about what's the right thing to do. And when, when people know that they've been heard, not humored, but heard, and that their input has been factored into the decision, they can support things even if they disagreed. And when we don't have that conflict, we are begging them not to commit. Are they going to go, what are they going to do if we don't have the, con if the conflict and I make the decision? Are they going to go sabotage the new satellite church? No. I wish they would because that would be far more interesting. <laughs> but that only happens on TV and in the movies. In real life, it, what happens is far more boring and more dangerous. What they do is they passively commit. They nod their head and smile at the meeting. And then they go back to their department or their office and they say, ah, I don't know if this is a good idea. And they tell people, yeah, I'm not sure this is a good idea. And then when they see an issue, they alligator arm things. You know, they're like, oh, let me help you with that. Oh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> or they see a train wreck about to happen. And instead of jumping out there and going, wait, they step back and they go, watch this. <laughs> And then the leader calls them back and says, what's going on? And they said, well, I never really thought it was the right idea in the first place. Ooh, that's painful. That's why we have to get that out on the table up front. We have to demand that people weigh in. We have to demand that conflict so that we can get real commitment. So I want you to think about what he's saying because you know, now that I'm aware of these dysfunctions, I see them happening um, all around me and have become much more committed to trying to put these principles into action. Um, you know, how often do we think we have consensus on something and then, you know, what we plan to execute does not occur? And it's probably because people didn't weigh in. Um, people want to be heard um, more, I think, than getting their way. And then we have lack of accountability. And this creates resentment among team members when, um, especially this has to come from the leader. The leader has to hold people accountable. Sometimes it's publicly, um, more often privately, um, but a little bit of taking that risk for public accountability does set the tone and role models. Ideally, we would achieve peer-to-peer -peer accountability, which is um, much more difficult and much more uncomfortable for most of us. We're not used to it. We feel like we're telling our peers how to do their jobs. But really, if we don't um, hold our peers accountable and then end up as my um, patient did, taking up the lion's share, it leads to resentment and it'll negatively influence the relationship anyway, which is what sometimes people are afraid of in the first place. It lowers standards of performance, encouraging uh, mediocrity, uh, deadlines and deliverables will be missed 
And um, again, if peers don't do this, it leaves an undue burden on the leader to discipline. I think this is a, a pretty good capture of that. And I'm having Pat help me um, flush out all of these dysfunctions because he's such a dynamic speaker. So I hope you're enjoying this. Why is it so important that we get real commitment? Well, that sounds obvious, but the real reason why there's a practical reason, because if we don't get commitment, then we're going to have the next dysfunction at our doorstep. And that is the avoidance of accountability. God bless you. This is the worst, most common problem. We have an online team assessment that teams take and they give a scorecard back of this triangle that says green, yellow, red, which of the ones are good or bad. And this is usually the lowest score. What happens is when people haven't committed to a decision, they're not gonna have the courage to hold one another accountable for that, for the behavior that goes with it. They're not gonna have the courage to hold one another accountable. Notice what I said there. I didn't say the leader holding them accountable. I said them holding one another accountable. You see on great teams, accountability is peer to peer. Peer pressure in your organization is the best kind of accountability. You want people turning to one another. What's the opposite of that is when people see a team member not supporting something, they go, oh, hey, boss, I want to tell you, she's not supporting this. Don't tell her it was me that told you, but I just want you to know. And the boss is like, oh, great, I get to go. And he goes to that person, hey, I understand you're not doing it. Who told you that? Oh, don't worry about who told you. I just want to, and now they're wondering who ratted them out, and there's all this politics, and the leader's dragged into it. What a great thing when people turn to one hey, another. What's, what's wrong? What's going on? I don't think this is what we agreed to. And give them the benefit of the doubt to explain what's happening, but call them on it directly. Okay, now, how do we create a team environment where there's peer accountability and we as leaders are not getting dragged into it all the time? Well, there's an irony to this. The only way to create an environment where people will hold each other accountable is if we as leaders are willing to confront difficult issues. See, the irony is if I as a leader am willing to confront people, then people know, well, he's gonna do it anyway, we might as well do it from each other, for each other. But if I, as a leader, do not like to hold people accountable, and let me tell you something, I don't. I'm bad at this one. This is my problem as a leader, and I'm very aware of that. I do not like to hold people accountable. You know what that means? My team isn't gonna do it. Why should they do it? Pat's gonna let you off the hook anyway. See, the irony is by me not being willing to, they're not gonna do it. By the way, there's a technical term for people who don't like to hold their, their folks accountable. I don't know if you've ever studied graduate level psychology or business, but I'm what's called a wuss. <laughs> okay. And you know what's funny? Most of the leaders I work with are also wusses. Most of them don't think so. In fact, most CEOs I work with will say, well, Pat, I don't have a problem with accountability. Let's just move right on to the next thing. And I'm like, well, that's great to know. Why do you say that though? And they say, well, because I fire people all the time. I mean, I fired a guy just last week. Pick someone, I'll fire him right now just to prove it to you. <laughs> of course, firing someone is often the last act of cowardice, not accountability. Sometimes it's necessary, oh, I know that. But oftentimes it's not. See, let me tell you a couple stories. I worked with a CEO once. He got hired by a big company that was kind of struggling. And they, they gave him the title of CEO, president, and chief operating officer. He had all the big titles. A year after stabilizing this company, he went to the board of directors and he said, listen, I don't want to be the president and chief operating officer anymore. I just want to be the CEO and focus on strategy and externals. I want to hire somebody to run the day-to-day -day operations. The board said, hey, you've earned the right to do that, fine. So he went out looking for a new president and chief operating officer. And while he was out looking, one of the members of his team, who I will call Fred, Fred started to tell his peers, I'm going to be the next president. It will be me. I remember this and I thought it must be true. I mean, who would say that? Well, people did not like Fred at all on the executive team. He was not liked at all. And people were really concerned that they were going to have to work for this guy. So finally, one member of the executive team went to CEO and said, can I ask you a question? The CEO said, sure. He said, did you know that Fred is telling everybody he's going to be the next president? And the CEO said, no, I had no idea. That's news to me. I had not heard that. And he said, okay, um, next question. Is he going to be the next president? The CEO said, oh, no, I would never do that. No, he would, no, there's no chance, no. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, last question. Are you going to tell him to stop telling everybody that? Here's what the CEO said in this case verbatim, but I've heard this from many leaders over the years, the same kind of answer. The CEO said, oh, I don't have the time and the energy for that. I don't have the time and the energy for that. 
I don't know about you, but can you imagine the CEO pick up the phone? Hey, Fred, it's the CEO. How you doing? Yeah. Hey, you're not going to be the next president. No, no, you're not. Yeah. You're kind of pissing me off that you're telling everybody that. Yeah, you should stop, buddy. Yeah, if you don't stop doing that, something bad's going to happen to you. Okay, have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Who's tired? I'm not tired. That took, what, 10 seconds? I don't have the time and the energy for that. Okay, and then we go on, and Pat's getting a little bit ahead of us by talking about how to overcome the dysfunctions, which we will get to. Um, the inattention to results. So this is when team members focus on their own careers and individual gains at the expense of a team and um, work in silos without focusing on the collective whole. So this would be where leaders of other teams come to the number one team and then fight for resources for those other teams instead of thinking about what is for the good of the whole. Um, there's competition and resentment that ends up occurring among the team members. And um, you know, really it, it makes the organization tank in terms of being able to reach their goals and productivity and any kind of metrics. This is probably my favorite of the series. I have to move on here and talk about the last dysfunction of a team, the inattention to results. The reason why we have to hold people accountable is because if we don't, they're going to think that the results don't matter. Because we have to hold them accountable to results. It's not always financial results. If it's in the church, it's saving souls. If it's feeding people, it's the, the hungry who get food. And so how do we make sure that people are focused on results? Well, what else would they pay attention to if not results? Well, how about their budget, their department, their career, their status, their ego? God bless you. Now, just in case you don't think people in your organization are selfish enough to think about themselves and to, over the team, I want to tell you a story from the world of sports. Now, I don't know how many of you follow basketball, but there's a team called the Chicago Bulls that you know Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is pretty famous. Michael Jordan used to play for the Chicago Bulls. And after he retired, the second best player on the Bulls was a guy named Scottie Pippen. Scottie Pippen was one of the best players in the NBA, and they had a great team around him and a great coach. And even after Jordan retired, they said this team could very well win the championship again. And so they, they, they made it to the playoffs, and they were playing their hated rival, the New York Knicks. And they were on the sideline, tie game, 20,000 people in the arena, national television, tie game with two seconds left in the game. The Bulls called timeout to take the last shot to win the game. The coach drew the team over to the sideline and he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get the ball to this guy named Tony Kukoc, a European player who was a really good shooter, and he's going to have the best chance to make the basket. Pippen looked at the sheet and said, no, no, I should get the ball. I'm the best player. And the coach said, no, no, no. See, Kukoc will have a better chance to have an open shot. So he's going to take it. And he goes, no, I get the ball. I'm the best player. And the coach said, no, you don't get the ball. See, Kukoc is going to get the ball. You're not. You're going to be over here. And he's, the, the player said, if I don't get the ball, then I'm not going out on the court. The coach said, okay, you're in for Pippen. They put him in, the best player sat on the bench. The, the, the fans were like, why is he not in the game? And the announcers were like, did he foul out? Did he get injured? What happened? No, he refused to play. The team made the shot, won the game, but that's irrelevant. The moral of this story is this. I wish everybody in this room, all of your organizations and churches, had people with the courage and audacity of Scottie Pippen who could stand up in front of everyone and say, listen, you guys, it's not about the team, it's about me. Because then we'd know who to fire. <laughs> I mean, that'd be so nice. It's like, thank you for telling me. I always thought that about you, but I wasn't sure, but thank you. But they're not going to do that. They're going to go to meetings and nod and smile. And that's why we have to make sure they're focused on results. And the only way to do that is to hold them accountable out of love. And the only way to do that is to make sure that they're committed. The only way to get that commitment is if they disagree passionately. And the only way to do that is if they trust each other and are vulnerable. And I've gone a little bit over my time. I'm sorry. Thank you for having me here. God bless you. And in the book, if you recall, um, Catherine tells a story about her husband, who is a basketball coach and um, had a uh, one of the students on the team who was more interested in his individual statistics than the overall score and didn't make the cut the following year. And then he went on to play in college and became a real team player. Now that probably happens 
um, for like one out of 10 who go through that kind of an experience, um, but the point is well made. Okay, so how to overcome the five dysfunctions. There is a um, five dysfunction team assessment that I can send um, probably to Karen to send out to all of you if you're interested. Um, you take it, um, it's important that you have a functioning team, even if it's dysfunctional, the people have to know each other well enough on this team. It can't be a newly, brand new, um, newly formed team to do this. And the questions lead to score for each of the areas of weakness along those five dysfunctions. And then um, you'll know where you stand in terms of a baseline, in terms of the areas that um, are weakest and need most attention. One of the principles uh, to trust building is learning not to make assumptions about behavior and understanding as, uh, each other as humans. So how, how do you do that? Um, there are reasons why people behave like they do. We tend to make what are called attributional biases. We do this all the time. I'm driving in the car and somebody cuts me off and I might have all sorts of nasty things I'm thinking about that person. Whereas if I do the same behavior, instead of making an internal attribution about what a jerk this person is and, and how they don't care about anybody but themselves, um, I would tend to probably make an external attribution um, saying that, oh, I'm late and I'm trying to get to a meeting and I'm in a hurry. Um, same thing with if you see a parent scolding a child in a grocery store um, and it looks a little excessive, it would be easy to label the, patient, the parent as um, somewhat abusive and over the top. Whereas if I'm scolding my own child for the same reason, I might think, well, they really deserve that and I, I need to show that there's a consequence. So we do this all the time with each other. And I think a good example in the book um, happened with Martin who people saw as egocentric and arrogant until they did one of the trust building exercises. And he began to talk, began to talk about how he was uncomfortable with emotion and he'd rather have uh, intellectual conversation. It put him in a whole different light. He also um, talked about being perfectionistic and often late in uh, handing in parts of work that others were relying on again that behavior was seen as, that kind of procrastination was, be, see, was seen as dismissive and inconsiderate when it was really part of an issue that was for him. So some ways that we can work on reducing fundamental attribution biases are engaging in some of these trust exercises. Um, in the book, as you recall, at the first offsite, um, the team engaged in what's called a personal history exercise. And as Lencioni says, this is not about inner, the inner child or deep, dark secret. It's a low level vulnerability exercise to start to let down guards about um, always putting forth a strong persona and your strengths and allowing some weaknesses, opinions, and some personal life experience um, come forward. So the leader always goes first in these exercises to role model and create a safe environment. Some examples of prompts, and I did this with my teams, um, would be where did you grow up? How many siblings do you have and what's your birth order? Who's in your family? Describe the most difficult, important, or unique um, challenge from childhood. What was your first job or your worst job? And in the first team we did this with, one of our faculty has been with our department, oh gosh, I'd say at least over 30 years. I've been um, at USC for 12 and nobody knew he was married for 40 years. No one knew that his brother gave him a dog. I mean, some of them may seem like um, silly things about our, our families, our, our preferences, our childhood experiences. Um, uh, however, it, it really eases tension. And for any of you who have participated in any kind of icebreakers and workshops or retreats where this approach is taken, it really just reduces the tension in the room and it creates a much more personal atmosphere for people to be able to um, start to open up. And then there's something called the team effectiveness exercise, um, which is where every individual on the team thinks about what their most significant contribution is to the team. 
and what their areas of growth are. And then they go around and share those. One way of doing it is um, if, if it's a little larger team to have each individual respond to those prompts. If it's a very small team that's been working together for a while and um, has already um, some semblance of trust and less guardedness, you can ask each team member to say what they think the other person's uh, unique contribution is and what would be an area of growth. So again, it's, a number, it's another way to start to um, make it okay to talk about the things that we don't necessarily put um, our uh, foot forward. Then um, doing personality profiles can also be very useful. It's, it uh, further helps to reduce attributional biases by understanding how people think in terms of what their thinking style is, what their behavioral style is in a framework. These are objective, validated, non-judgmental instruments. In the book, they use something called a Myers-Briggs personality type indicator. I know Pat Lencioni is, um, he tends to favor that and uh, have a preference for that. There's also an Enneagram model and there's another uh, personality profile available that's called Emergenetics. And that's what we've used in the Department of Psychiatry. So I'm gonna talk about that for just a moment. I've been very impressed by this tool. Um, it's, it, the Emergenetics comes from the two words emerge and genetics. It's a combination of characteristics that emerge based on genetics, environmental life interaction. Your profile based on the one that comes um, up for genetics can change with great intention or serious um, life um, events. It's usually fairly stable over time unless somebody makes a concerted effort to change their profile. It's psychometrically sound. It's renormed every two years. Um, this was developed by two researchers and they collected data in over 10,000 people worldwide when they were um, first establishing validation. The temperament is described in terms of three behavioral aspects and four thinking attributes. And the good thing about these profiles is they come from a standpoint where there is no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. There's no better or worse. And the idea is if we learn each other's proclivities, then we can, again, reduce making attributional biases that this is just the way we are. These are this is our unique package. And we can build on each other's strengths in our team. So the Emergenetics, uh, Know Yourself, Know Your Team, it was developed by Browning and Williams. And um, I'll show you an example of a profile, but basically in this circle here, it's divided up into four quadrants and these are thinking styles. So people who are analytical and, and we're, most of us are trimodal with strengths in some areas and less in others. Um, some people uh, have more than 50% in one area, but uh, more likely they're trimodal, and I'll explain what I mean about that. So the analytical people are clear thinkers, logical, problem solvers, rational. Probably see this a lot in researchers. Um, also likely conceptual, imaginative, visionary, and intuitive about ideas. Um, it's interesting that uh, there are differences among departments. We did this with our leadership um, in a retreat and um, Kathy Nelson, who is our um, vice dean for wellness and leadership did comment that she's done this for several departments and the department of psychiatry was much more social than some of the other departments in medicine. So uh, social thinkers are intuitive about people, very socially aware, very relational, and structural thinkers are practical thinkers. They like guidelines and predictable. And so as you can imagine, we really need some of all of these to create a whole brain. In terms of behavioral attributes, the three are expressiveness, which isn't about um, just how much 
emotion someone expresses, but but um, it's a display of emotions towards others and interest in others and about the world at large. Assertiveness has to do with um, a style and pace with, uh, uh, with which you advance on thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. So I, I like a description, somebody who is very assertive um, probably you might see them standing at an elevator or a crosswalk pushing the button as if continually pushing it is going to make it happen faster. These people want things done, want projects complete. Um, and then flexibility has to do with the willingness to accommodate the thoughts and actions of other people. And all of these are on a continuum. This is an example of a profile from one of um, my leadership groups in psychiatry and so as you can see we're a little this group in particular was a little low in the structural to have um a tendency in one of these thinking styles one or the group needs to score a 23 percent or higher to have that attribute so in our leadership group in this um, particular one, we're trimodal, where analytical, conceptual, and social are the main um, modes of thinking and less structural. So we need to be sure that we're definitely engaging our structural thinkers um, to be able to uh, basically make sure we're following guidelines and, and getting things done. Um, I will also say that when you do the emergenetics, you will receive your, if any of you ever choose to do this, you or have your team do it, you receive your individual profile with a narrative, receive a debriefing um, that elaborates on how these thinking uh, concepts and also behavioral attributes play out, gives a lot of examples. Um, I have not had any of my faculty comment that it was off. People thought it was really dead on. And then um, this is a composite of a group. So then you can also take the individual scores and create a composite so you can see what any particular leadership team looks like. And thankfully in this group, we also look like we're pretty much um, averaging towards the norm in terms of expressiveness, assertiveness, and flexibility. Um, because it's really difficult, as you can imagine, if you have a lot of people on your team who tend to be highly assertive and also inflexible. That can definitely lead to unproductive um, conflict. So these styles also come up in how we organize our offices. Uh, as you might see, the one on the left is probably somebody who's much more conceptual, and the one on the right is someone who's more structural or analytical. I actually um, am very fond of a faculty in our department whose office looks like the one on the left and they know where exactly everything is, even though it makes me anxious to be in their office. Um, it's also reflected in how we dress. So the more colorful dress could be social, um, could be conceptual, the more structured dress could be a more structured thinker or somebody uh, who's more analytical. And then in terms of these behavioral attributes, um, if we think about initially the way that these showed up in some of the characters in the book, uh, I would say Martin was probably low in expressiveness, low participation in social situations, not really taking much interest in others, not sharing much personally, and probably uh, also low in flexibility. You know, he just really knew about what went on in tech and not so much in the other areas. Carlos, um, I would say, was probably low in assertiveness and high in flexibility. He was willing to take on any task and fill all the gaps, probably to his detriment. And I think initially the team took advantage of this. And then Mikey, um, high in assertiveness. She definitely uh, had a high interest in controlling tasks and results probably low in expressiveness, surprisingly, not that she wasn't expressive, but she really didn't show much interest in others. And she certainly wasn't willing to um, engage in any vulnerability exercises in a, in a very truthful way and low in flexibility. And so just even thinking about these concepts without 
actually taking that person personally profile, you probably could um, start to put yourself in some of these buckets and maybe even think about where some of your coworkers might go. This, this slide shows you how um, presentations are given and it's in a very strict sense. So again, none of us are just one, prep, one thinking preference. Um, but somebody who's analytical would want the budget and numbers, one color of pen, have a credible, credible speaker, written information, a structural person likes agendas, neatness and order, formatting, wants an action plan, making sure the loop is closed. Social would want to build rapport, have eye contact, um, apply the information to themselves, be very sensitive to how information lands on other people, uh, how um, their behavior lands on other people. And a conceptual person would want um, the budget and pictures, a lot of change, leaving things to the imagination. Um, and one of the leadership workshops I took, and we did this in one of our leadership retreats, one of the exercises was to break up in groups according to the thinking style in which um, we had the highest percentage and we worked in teams to plan a vacation um, very strictly according to these different thinking styles. And quite honestly, I did not want to go on any of them. <laughs> um, also, again, expressive uh, has ways that they want to approach a meeting on a continuum from of no role plays to opportunities to speak. Assertiveness would be being sensitive and then challenging thinking and then a continuum of flexibility. So what does vulnerability trust look like? Um, as, as you've heard, already uh, Lencioni talk about the people on teams who have vulnerability trust, they're unafraid to say things like, I'm really sorry, I know I made a mistake, I'm really not sure, I need your help, you're better that, at this than I am, will you help me? And it begins with the leader who's willing to take interpersonal risks with a degree of certainty that the members of the team have the leader's back, and they all have each other's back. So behavior isn't misconstrued. To master conflict, again, it's about open ideological disagreement, not personal disagreement, tolerating the discomfort and learning from it that it's not about personal issues, um, not focusing on issues that are interpersonal. And um, I'm happen to be on one leadership team where the leader often uses this statement and I've pirated it and have adopted it as my own because I think this is very true. A lot of times when people sit in silence, especially now that we're out on Zoom and it's difficult, people don't want to interrupt each other, people don't know when it's their turn to speak, um, and people often end up being silent. But you see this in in-person meetings too. Leaders often mistake silence as agreement. So this one um, very admirable leader will often say things like, I don't take silence as yes. Um, there's this idea of mining for conflict. Sometimes it's the leader, as you saw in the five dysfunctions where Catherine would say things to her team when they got quiet or thought that the disagreement was unhealthy. And she'd say, no, no, you know, I want to hear everybody's opinion or would ask people what they thought um, purposely to bring them forward so that they'd speak their mind. And sometimes it's a plant. You might have another team member who the, the leader actually asked to help to mine for the conflict. Um, as you saw with decision tech, there was a very lively team debate about the results. And this is a good example of healthy conflict where they were talking about whether it should be the goal of the, um, of the company should be looking at um, improving the technological product versus marketing versus revenue versus market share versus new customers. And then achieving commitment. As Lencioni said, the statement from Intel, disagree and commit is a very useful one. And at some point, the leader does need to make a decision. The team members might disagree but then they achieve buy-in for the greater good of the whole. So these aren't just about representing areas that are close to home for each team member. It's really about thinking about the greater, the greater whole and standing behind the leader's decision. I heard a recent um, podcast where um, 
Lencioni and his team were talking about uh, how to uh, break down politics. And they made, Lencioni made the comment that if while they're having um, one of these discussions where there's a lot of disagreement and the janitor comes into the room and uh, makes a comment that's actually something useful that would be in the best interest of the team, that he would give that airtime. Um, so yes, seniority is important and um, people's rank in the team, but also it's about what is in the best interest of the team. And then at some point the leader uh, has to have the courage as Catherine did, right? And said, we need to make this decision in five minutes. I think we have two clear um, contenders, market share and new customers and, and then let people have another go round. Um, but then she said, okay, ladies and gentlemen, after hearing what everybody had to say in terms of their opinion and, and their way in, uh, she announced that their goal would be to increase um, new customers. And then there was another discussion about what would that magic number be? So she moved the team to think about the results and what's also known as SMART goals. So those are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. So the goal for um, Decision Tech was that they would acquire 18 new customers over 12 months. And then they talked about action items. So who would be responsible for what? And then by doing so, having clear priorities, specific action plans and contingency plans. So to help with that idea of, oh, are we making the right decision? People need to know that, they're, that the team would be ready to pivot if in fact this wasn't the right way to go. Admit they made a mistake, regroup and choose a new direction. Um, and then by focusing on results, people can hold each other accountable because they'll know what those action plans, what those performance indicators are. Sometimes it's helpful to put up a scoreboard and the team advances as a priority. The team members, their individual careers will advance as a byproduct of this. How can we create more of this win-win? And, and I'd like you to think about that. Um, and perhaps we can have part of that be more of a discussion in terms of how you might be able to employ some of this in your own areas, your own teams to overcome the dysfunctions. Um, again, a lot of examples are drawn, drawn from sports, thinking about the team record versus individual statistics. Um, how can we apply this to grant funding, publications, day-to-day -day lab functioning? How can we use this model to promote research team functioning? So now I'd like to move to, because we've been talking about um, how to make teams more healthy, um, I'd like us to turn our attention now to what makes an ideal team player. So Lencioni um, has a model that's based on three virtues. And he talks about the importance of these three specific virtues that are integral for any ideal team player. The first one is being humble, which has to do with humility. The next one is hungry. So having an appetite for success, willing to roll up your sleeves and do the hard work, and then being smart. And the smart refers to emotional intelligence. I'd like everybody to take out a paper or writing implement, or maybe you would use your phone if you don't have something accessible. We're going to walk through um, the ideal team player assessment in just a moment. So to further define um, what these are, humble refers to a lack of excessive ego or concerns about status, quick to point out the contributions of others, slow to seek attention for your own, sharing credit, emphasizing the team over oneself, defining success collectively rather than individually. People are hung who are hungry are always looking for more, willing to take responsibility, never have to be pushed by their manager or supervisor to work harder. They're self-motivated, very diligent, constantly thinking about the next step and the next opportunity. And people who are smart have common sense about people, tend to know what is happening in group situations and how to deal with others in the most effective way. They have good judgment and intuition about the subtleties of group dynamics 
and impact of words and actions on others. Are you an ideal team player? So um, Lencioni is gonna get into this. I'm gonna show another brief clip that's really wonderful where he describes these various um, uh, virtues. And in this Venn diagram, he will also talk about people who are humble and hungry, but not smart. He calls them accidental mess makers. People who are humble and smart, but not hungry are lovable slackers. I'm sure we all know a lot of lovable slackers who we tend to let off the hook because they're so darn nice. The most dangerous of the three is the skillful politician. So that's somebody who is hungry and smart, knows how to act humble, but really isn't. Are you an ideal team player? Okay, so I'm very excited to be here. I'm also a little nervous. Now I speak for a living, so I shouldn't be nervous, but this, uh, this is probably one of the talks that there's a good chance my kids are gonna see. In fact, my eighth grader said, you're doing a TEDx talk? And I said, Michael, I do a lot of talks. He goes, yeah, but this is big, Dad. <laughs> I'm excited to be here because I think it's time that we change the way we thought about success as a society. In fact, better yet, I think it's time that we change the way we prepare people for success at all levels of life. So I'm going to be presenting you with three very simple, but I think powerful virtues that I'm convinced can drastically change the success level in anyone's life, whether they're a CEO or a middle manager, a middle school student or a high schooler or a recent college grad. Now I'm confident of this because I believe, and all of this is based on the premise that life more than ever is a team sport. My name is Pat Lencioni, and I have been working with teams for the past 25 years in the corporate world and in other settings. I've also written two books about teamwork. The first one I wrote years ago, it's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And then recently I wrote a, a sequel called The Ideal Team Player, which is the basis of today's talk and where I explore those three virtues. Now, when I say that life is a team sport, I realize that could sound kind of like a cheesy cliche, you know, life is a team sport, but I really believe it's true. I mean, we take for granted the fact that in the workforce today, people can be on the same team as somebody that lives on the other side of the world, across continents and oceans and cultures and language. And that's largely because of technology. But when I started my career about 30 years ago, which isn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things, we couldn't even imagine doing this. But today, because of technology, people can work together in so many different ways. And as a result of that technology, people are developing in organizations solutions that are amazing and complex, that are solving problems in business and medicine and communication and every kind of field. And those complex solutions demand that people collaborate and work as teams to implement them. Even within a company, you have to work across divisional or departmental lines or with people in other companies. Even competitors today are having to work together to implement these important solutions. This really is the era of teamwork in business. But even in our personal lives, teamwork has permeated everything. My wife and I have four sons at home, and we like to say that by the time that each of them was in middle school, they had played on more teams with more coaches in more sports and gone to more darn tournaments than we did in our entire lives combined. And that's to say nothing of all the other extracurricular activities that happen on teams. Even in the classroom, teamwork is everywhere. I mean, my kids come home. I don't know how many times they've come home with an assignment and said those four dreaded words. It's a group project. <laughs> and I ask them that dreaded four word question, who's on your team? <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say that more than once I've said to my sons, if you want to get a good grade, you might have to be prepared to do most of the work yourself. <laughs> Teamwork is everywhere. And yet we continue to train people in education and in the workforce for primarily individual and technical skills. And I think that needs to change. And that's why I'm going to present to you these three simple virtues. 
All right. Okay, that's the end of my memorized part of my speech, which freaked me out because I don't memorize anything. Now let's just talk. All right, so we're gonna go to the first slide. In my book, The Ideal Team Player, I explore these three simple virtues, but the power of those virtues is in the commonality of them all. We have to have all three. If you play baseball and you're one for three hitter, that's pretty good, it's terrible in, in teamwork. If you're two for three as a quarterback in passing, that's pretty good. You gotta be three for three when it comes to teamwork. So let's talk about these three virtues. Let me introduce you to them and then talk about how we can identify and improve ourselves if we're lacking any. So the first virtue of ideal team player is by far the most important. And it is humility. If you wanna be an ideal team player and if you wanna be successful in life, you really need to be humbled more than ever. Now this is the most important because as a follower of Jesus, the Bible says that the root of all sin is pride. And I believe that. You look at all the problems we have, it's usually rooted in pride. Well, the antidote to pride is humility. So it stands to reason that this would be the most important. And most of us know what humility is, right? It's not being ego-centered or arrogant or self-centered, but being about others, putting others ahead of ourselves. It's such an attractive and powerful thing. But there's another side of humility we have to understand too. It's in the minority, but it's still important to understand. See, some people will look at another person and say, she never talks about herself. She never demands that we listen to her. She never thinks she has the right answer. She's really humble. And when somebody lacks confidence, it's actually not humility. You see, when we have an idea or a talent, to deny our God-given talents is actually a violation of humility, just like it is to exaggerate them. C.S. Lewis said it best. He said, humility isn't thinking less of ourselves, it's thinking about ourselves less. But the most prominent kind of lack of humility we see in teams in the workforce and in life is arrogance and ego-centeredness. So this is the first and most important attribute. The second one is equally simple, and it is you have to be hunger. You have to be hungry. People who have an innate hunger about getting work done are much more successful on teams and in life. And this is simply just having a strong work ethic. And this is probably the easiest one to understand, but I'll say this to the young people out there. This is the one that you probably have to, to develop earliest in life. When I work with people later in life who never developed an innate sense of hunger, it's harder. And so I talk to kids in middle school and I say, do it now. Work hard at everything you do. This is not about workaholism though. Workaholics are people who get their entire identity from their work. And that's not what I'm saying here. People who are hungry just have want to go above and beyond, have a high standard for what they do, and never do the minimum. They never do just the minimum. Now, the third attribute of an ideal team player is what I call being smart. But it's not about intellectual smarts. This is about emotional intelligence, common sense around how we understand people and how we use our words and actions to bring out the best possible impact in others. This is so important in the world. And it is you can develop this in life. Being smart is one of those things that people can work on and get better at. So humble, hungry, smart. These are the three simple virtues. But the key is that we have to have all three to be an ideal team player. So it's really important that we learn how to identify in ourselves and others when one is lacking. So what I'm gonna do now is come up with some labels, which I want you to use carefully, for people that lack one of these in a very serious, egregious way. So let's take a look at those now. A person who is humble, the most important one, they think about others ahead of themselves, and they're hungry, they work really hard, but they lack smarts, they're not emotionally intelligent. We call this the accidental mess maker. Now, the, I have a lot of time for accidental mess makers. They're good people, they have really good intentions, but they kind of create problems that they're not aware of. They're like that dog, that puppy, I have a puppy at home, and they knock things over a lot, but they mean well, and they poop on the carpet, and you have to clean up after them. But because they mean well, you can whack them on the nose of the newspaper and they come back for more. They have a great attitude. The problem with accidental mess makers is just you do have to clean up with them. They create a little bit extra work. And over time, you kind of get tired of having to say, he's a really good guy. He didn't mean it that way. Nonetheless, of the three types that lack one of these virtues, I will take the accidental mess maker. The second one is also a very good kind. That's somebody who's humble, the most important one. And they're smart. They're good at dealing with people. But they lack hunger. We call this kind the lovable slacker. 
Now, lovable slackers, the problem is they're lovable. So they're really fun to be around and they're good people, they're nice people, but they just do the bare minimum. They don't go above and beyond and you have to constantly remind them to do more and, and you have to kind of pick up their slack in an organization. Now, I once worked with a lovable slacker, a good friend of mine still is, and every time I reminded him that he needed to do more, he would say, you're right. And he was so passionate in life about everything besides work, right? But because he was lovable, he was so fun to be with. And I said to him one day, I said, you know, you're gonna have to leave this company when you're good and ready. And five years later, he was out that door. <laughs> the truth is it's very easy to tolerate lovable slackers, but they do have a, a problem. They cause problems on a team. Now, the third type is the most difficult type. This is the person who is hungry. They really wanna work hard, they're ambitious. And they're smart, so they're really good at dealing with people, but they're not humble. And we call this the skillful politician. I'm sure your mayor here is not the skillful politician in this sense. No, she's probably a skillful leader, but not the skillful politician in this sense. Skillful politicians are so smart that they know how to portray themselves as being humble, which is a very dangerous thing. Because what they do is they interview well, they go to meetings and they, and they say the right things. They know how to kiss up to the boss or the coach or the teacher. The problem is deep down inside, it's about them, not about others. And by the time we figure it out, there's usually a trail of dead bodies hidden in closets around the organization. I once worked with a team, with this guy on the team that was a skillful politician. So I think you get an idea of um, what he's talking about with these labels. And please be careful about calling anybody a lovable slacker or a skillful politician um, or accidental mess maker unless you uh, let them know what you're talking about. <laughs> so this exercise we're going to go through, um, it's a self-assessment and it can be done a couple different ways. Um, I did this with my team and we first um, emailed it out and asked all the team members to um, complete this, think about it, and then talk with the find, talk with friends and family about the finding and get feedback. Um, we're gonna do this in reverse today. So I invite you to um, participate, to see where you fall out according to this assessment, and then take the findings with you. I, I will also email a copy so you have the items um, that can be distributed too. Because it's important not just to look at the main virtue, but the actual items that you think you fall short on and um, get some feedback. You'd be surprised. I talked to my daughter and husband about it and it actually changed my perception. They had some feedback where I was a little bit um, short-sighted. So you're going to rate yourself on a usually, a sometimes, and a rarely. So usually is three, sometimes is two, rarely is one. And um, this is what you think your teammates would say, um, but I also want you to include the truth that you know about yourself in terms of how you would rate yourself, not just what you think others' perceptions are. So the first item under humble is I compliment or praise team members without hesitation. I, the next, so that's, you give that a three, a two, or a one. The next item is I easily admit to my mistakes. The next one is I am willing to take on lower level work for the good of the team. I gladly share credit for team accomplishments. I readily acknowledge my weaknesses and I offer and accept apologies graciously. So do your best to rate yourself with what you think comes to mind. Um, like I said, I'll distribute this so you can go back and reflect when you have a little more time before you elicit feedback. The items under hungry 
are, I do more than what is required in my own job. I have passion for the mission of the team. I feel a sense of personal responsibility for the overall success of the team. I am willing to contribute to and think about work outside of office hours. I am willing to take on tedious or challenging tasks whenever necessary. And the last item for Hungry is I look for opportunities to contribute outside of my area of run responsibility on the team. <clears throat> So why don't you go ahead also and total up what your humble score would be by adding up your self rating for items one through six and then do the same for the hungry virtue, which is items seven through 12. Okay, and last is the virtue of SMART. Again, I don't have the anchor points, but three is usually, what we have there, three is usually, two is sometimes, and one is rarely. I generally understand what others are feeling during meetings and conversations. I show empathy to others on the team. I demonstrate an interest in the lives of my teammates. I am an attentive listener. I am aware of how my words and actions impact others on the team. I adjust my behavior and style to fit the nature of a conversation or relationship. And then go ahead and get a total for the SMART. I will say that in conversation, a lot of us um, in psychiatry thought we were pretty aware of how our words and actions impact others on the team, but realized that we could definitely do a better job with that. Okay, so you have a score for humble, hungry, and smart. And then um, we'll now go through what the scores mean. So again, the purpose of the tool is to help you explore and um, assess how you embody these three virtues of an ideal team player. And the standards for ideal are pretty high. So an ideal team player will have few of these statements answered with anything lower than a three. A total score of 17 to 18 in any virtue is an indication that the virtue is a potential strength. If you're scoring 14 to 16, 
in any one of the virtues. It's an indication that you most likely have some work to do around that virtue to be an ideal team player. And a score of 13 or lower is an indication that you really need improvement in that virtue to become an ideal team player. So uh, just in, in finishing up, final notes on the ideal team player assessment is for you to keep in mind that the tool is quantitative, but the real value is in the qualitative developmental conversations that maybe you'll first have with family and friends, and then perhaps later with team members and managers or supervisors or PIs. Don't focus on the numbers, but rather the concepts and the individual statements and the individual items where you may have scored low. What we did with our team is we went around, people shared um, their self-assessment and then uh, the team provided feedback. So this is something that you could use um, with, with your teams as well. And in closing, I'd like to highlight some take home points. If you are a leader or if you want to become a leader, please lead for the right reasons. Identify your number one team, your highest team. It's worth the time to invest in tackling the five dysfunctions. Lencioni over and over again says, even though it seems like a big investment in time and a lot of people in leadership roles think they don't have time or have what he calls an adrenaline bias where they want just a quick fix, quick results. Um, this is a commitment. It's important to be aware of attributional biases, those kind of automatic thoughts, the way we judge one another when they're not um, giving us pieces for grants on time or not following up on um, aspects of their work that we're relying on. There could be, there not just could, there are reasons why that's not happening. Sometimes as in the situation I gave you with my patient, um, I think a lot of that had to do with lack of accountability from leadership on and also poor leadership. Um, but team for teams where there um, is fairly healthy functioning and intentions are good, there's usually reasons why people behave the way they do that's important for you to find out. Capitalize on individual strengths and work on areas of growth and ask for help when needed. Clarify goals and priorities so you can work cohesively. And the leader who serves for the good of the team plus a healthy team will have successful outcomes for the team and for individuals. I also think one of the biggest challenges is figuring out how to create team rewards to motivate individuals to work for the good of the team. So on that note, I will close and invite Dr. Siegel uh, to join me in some discussion and Q&A. See, I wasn't looking in the chat, but let's see. Um, yes, I can send a copy of the slides and also the, the team assessment as well as the um, ideal team player assessment. I'm happy to share that. So thank you, Barbara. That was a really nice overview of a process that, as you mentioned, can take months to affect. Um, and before we open to, to more questions, maybe you can just comment on some landmines and some caution um, through experience where, where maybe um, there are things people should be aware of so that they don't use the model for the right reasons and end up with an outcome other than what they had anticipated. Sure, Dr. Siegel. Um, it's been a lot of um, trial and error and learning and um, we did encounter some very um, in, intense, intense moments. I think that ideally, as you see, you know, in the five dysfunctions, Catherine, who's the CEO, who is the penultimate leader of this team, does guide the group through the process. And um, 
I think that one needs to be very sensitive if you're going to transport this to your team. Who is going to facilitate, first of all, um, through these stages and various team effectiveness exercises? It really ought to be somebody who is skilled in group dynamics, um, who is at top leadership. And if it's not the, the leader, the PI, the lab boss, the, the chair, um, you, you should best proceed with a caveat recognizing that there is a power differential. So if the head honcho, so to say, is not also leading and guiding the exercises, then the feedback isn't going to be on an equal playing field. You know, feedback from that individual is going to always carry more weight. So there may need to be some restraint in terms of um, being able to say everything that, that uh, one might want to otherwise. So I think you have to be cautious in thinking about how you're applying this model and to what team and the leadership role. Um, the other thing is it's easy for groups to get derailed. It's important, I think, to stick to an agenda and be able to interrupt. And if topics come off that are, are not germane, to be able to know when to sort of put it in the parking lot, as you will, and acknowledge that it's an important contribution, but um, that there is an agenda that's going to you're going to adhere to and you can circle back to it later. Um, also caution with having a lot of meetings before and meetings after the meeting and even potentially bringing together groups of people who already have a lot of cohesion into a leadership into a team or a leadership team where you have people new to that group because you already have a culture um, that you're going to have to um, rebuild so we have a couple of questions in the, the chat barbara i wanted to make sure we had time to get to them yep there's one in particular that i, I think would be good for you to address um, that asks, how does one choose a primary team when they wear multiple hats and have multiple roles? Any guidance that we can think about that you could recommend for how to determine what's your primary team and who should be on it? And you, you uh, I'm not sure if everyone can see the chat, but you should be able to see that. Yeah, as well. yeah. So yeah, that, that's a really, really good question. And I think taking caution when thinking about the primary team. So um, again, it, it's sort of, if you could ferret out like what your top team is. So if you're part of a leadership structure, it would be the highest executive group. Um, and then under that would be probably the re, who though you know who you are a leader of could be another team. Um, if you're forming a new team across groups, um, like I'm thinking, for example, I know sometimes grants are written. Um, by multiple PIs at different sites that can be multidisciplinary. So that could be one level of a number one team, but then each of those PIs would probably have another number one team at their various sites. Um, so I think the second, I, it's, it's, it's a hard question to answer. It's a good one. Uh, but I hope I've given you a little bit of guidance. Um, I want to make sure we have time for the others. Sure. Uh, might I suggest for that uh, question that the context may change. So if you're working in the health system and you have a job for the health system, your team one in that case may be the health system C-suite is your team one and everyone on the care team is in your team. But when you pivot and you're working in an academic role, then your team one might be your department structure or your school. So there is a degree of situationality here where you have to decide 
what is the role, and that may shift. So, uh, Barbara, maybe we can move to the next. Yeah, one. which is related. It's related, Steve. Yep. Can you, would you like me to read it or would you like to read it and answer? I am happy to read it. I'm going to ask for your help in answering. <laughs> so I'm happy to read it. What are some tips for leading teams in which the members are constantly changing and you are unaware of team members' abilities? For example, a surgeon operating in the OR when nurses, techs, and anesthesiologists frequently change shift or take breaks during a case. Hmm. So I think it might be helpful, Barbara, if you if you help someone define the concept of, of their team and then how those people have their own teams. So it might be that um, the surgeon in the OR might work with um, the, the chief nurse. That person's on their team, but not every nurse. Those people are in the chief nurse's team. Mm. They might think of the anesthesiologist as being on their team in that context. And then the anesthesiologist is, is leading the residents uh, and so forth on their team. And so maybe you can speak to this concept of cascading messages and mm -hmm. what an ideal team number is. Yeah, thank you for raising that up um, about that, um, that point about the cascading messages because I, I didn't want to get too off track, but it is relevant here. So as Dr. Siegel just described, I think that's a good way to conceptualize um, what one might do in this kind of situation. And so if the surgeon is meeting with the chief nurse, the, the um, head of uh, the anesthesiologist, the chief anesthesiology or head of anesthesiology, the head tech. Um, what happens, and it's talked about in the Lencioni model, this is also what's very important in terms of commitment is that at the end of the meeting, the team talks about what the messages they're going to take back to their various constituents on their other teams. And it helps to get clarity that everybody's heard the same thing and is going to communicate the same message. There's also a discussion about what should be kept confidential and what shouldn't. And so those messages then get cascaded back to those various teams so everybody can be included in participating towards results. So I hope that that helps. We probably have time for one more at least. I should also note everyone, please look in the chat for the evaluation. Uh, Karen has put that in there and we need you all to please do that. So again, for everyone in attendance, there's an evaluation survey in the chat. And then maybe one last question um, is, how do you adjust this model when everyone is remote? I actually am reading this when the team includes a member who works 100 for Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Well, yeah, no, that's okay because actually the issue of remote was not one. And Lenci, I encourage you if you're going to be doing this completely remotely, listen to Lencioni's podcast on five dysfunctions of a quarantine team because he does talk about using the virtual platform. Um, and we did, we did one of our leadership uh, team building uh, trainings in person and the second one we actually did during the quarantine and um, it it worked out pretty well it's um, you, you, it's hard because you can't always see everybody's facial expressions and you don't know if people are on their phones if they look distracted or multitasking so we did ask people to help keep each other accountable on that and feel comfortable sort of um, checking in um, I'm not sure if, if the issue is that the whole team is face to face and then one person works remotely. That's how I'm reading this. Um, I wouldn't see that as a necessary obstacle. Yeah, matters when, and it matters when one individual Oh, so if the issue is that that individual is working remotely and maybe has special 
uh, exception. I don't know, I'm trying to read into where that question. So it'd be helpful maybe to understand that a little better, but I think one of the issues might be uh, focus and commitment. And so maybe, you know, one, one thing that we had to do, and Barbara can expand a bit on this, is set ground rules at the beginning. Whether it's in person or remotely, there's ground rules around being present, uh, emotionally, attention-wise, if you can't be physically. So uh, as a, um, an example, physically present. I was late to one of the meetings and as chair there was some um, discussion about the extent to which people could really hold me accountable and pull me out. They made the decision to challenge me and so when I showed up late we had a, a uncomfortable but very important discussion about being present and that meant me or it meant no one similarly when it's remote you can think of it as being present so barbara always starts the sessions as our moderator and our leader by saying cameras on phones off email closed we are relying on you and trusting you we're, we're trusting your integrity to not be having chatter on the side, doing your texts, etc. If you are present, you must be present. So, so Barbara, let's see, mm -hmm. does that address the issue or is there a different one at hand? Yeah, no, I agree with the ground rules and also we also stressed how important it was that everyone attended all meetings. We came up against what to do. There were some people who wanted to take vacation. Um, it ended up that except for one time, one person, um, all of the members of the team even attended. It was important enough to them to be present and not miss any part of this process because it is the process that is what's going to create the team building and the growth. So if you miss out on it, you're going to miss a significant amount. It's not like a curriculum you can go back and read about what happened. Um, so we did have people attending remotely during vacations. I'm thinking, Steve, that maybe the issue is that the, this one member works remotely and maybe the team has some feelings about that. and. Um, I don't know. I, I, it's hard to it's hard to know, but maybe you can contact me offline if you wanted further input about that. I, I I wouldn't see it as an issue just because one person is working remotely if it's understood why that exception has been made. So again, in our case, as in the book, it was clear that team membership was important. Again, in our case, it meant you are part of departmental leadership. And there was one part that I struggled with, but um, ultimately, as Barbara said, we got this message across, which is if you are still present at the end of this, you will be part of a more functional team. It's hard to do that without being threatening, but what it meant is this is the most important thing to us. If it's not the most important thing to you, you are selecting that you no longer want to be part of leadership. And again, we had somebody who declined to participate fully, every meeting, every time, move it, move everything else out of the way. Ultimately, in the course of that several months, it became clear, it, it made it clear that individual would no longer remain in a leadership role, in part because the decision they made reflected their priorities. So whether you're home or, or working on site, physically present, so to speak, mentally present, 
emotionally present, or you're telling us you do not want to be part of this team, in which case we need to help you get out and get off of the team, which may mean you don't keep this job. It may mean you don't keep this role. Um, it's a choice. So Barbara, maybe you can wrap us yeah. up. And I think I think we clarified. So it, it's about the importance of all team members being present, needing to feel present and acknowledged in order to be accountable and committed to the team activities. Exactly. And being willing to have those difficult conversations for team member or members who are part of your team, but then have all sorts of reasons or schedule conflicts or whatever that they think interferes with the meetings. Um, we we um, kindly helped um, an individual step down from the leadership team. They need to be given permission if that's what their behavior is exhibiting, as Steve said. So it's pretty telltale. So anyway, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And, you know, as we can see from the lively comments in the chat, I think it really spoke to people. And if anyone in the audience wants to continue this discussion, I know that Dr. Van Oppen and I are happy to do that. Again, it's been invaluable for us and we hope to share that experience so others can profit from it. Thank you for the opportunity inviting me, Steve. Thank you all for your attention and I hope uh, you take some of this um, with you to your teams. Thank you.